Gymnastics is an ill-defined activity, <laughs> <laughs> and for that reason, we have to have a panel of uh, experts <clears throat> who observe the performance and then pass a judgment. And uh, there are a number of reasons why gymnastics is ill-defined, and I think complexity plays a big part. Events are uh, unfolding very, very rapidly, speed, height, no wobble, and so on and so on. That the sheer complexity makes it impossible to have a simple uh, judgment. There are other, two other factors. Uh, one is ambiguity. There are different aspects to the performance, speed, height, no wobble, and so on. And how do you uh, relate these? You could, for example, have a lexicographic order if there's wobble and the person's out. And you could have trade-offs. And these could be specified. But there are reasons for not wanting to do that. And the specification itself may be very hard to come by and even undesirable. And there's a third element that makes the gymnastics uh, ill-defined, and that is uh, the fact that the, there's an aesthetic element to it. It's a bit like a dance or so on. And aesthetic matters have uh, special characteristics, which surprisingly will have some relevance to the considerations of economics. <coughs> I was a little surprised that this uh, distinction between ill-defined and well-defined problems uh, only occurred in the 60s. I would have thought it would have been an ancient idea, but to my knowledge, it really came up in the literature in the 60s on the part of cognitive uh, psychologists. And the psychologists were primarily interested in <coughs> the relationship between artificial intelligence and the idea that uh, well-defined problems could be attacked, uh, addressed by machines, but only people could undertake ill-defined problems. So there were exceptions. Newell, for example, uh, wrote that there would be heuristics, some in a way quite barbarian in nature that would enable machines to address ill-defined uh, problems. Uh, John Hayes, the cognitive psychologist, wrote the, uh, it was generally credited with the first paper that drew this distinction, which I've already slipped into the discussion in terms of the initial goal, the process, and then the solution. And that three-way split is extremely important in the analysis that uh, follows. 
Reinman, Walter Reinman also wrote, I think he wrote the best book on this topic, and uh, Herbert Simon, <coughs> who always crops up everywhere, uh, also became very interested in this topic and was concerned about the complexities of the uh, categories. Yes? Um, Max, there's a technical term that's sometimes used in vision literature called ill-posed problems. Yeah. Is that the same thing as in the final? Well, I, yes. I, he, Simon doesn't use ill-defined and well-defined. He does use the word ill-posed. I can't see any difference myself. And uh, if there is one, I'd rather not hear about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, we have this three-way distinction, and there is a lot of entailment involved in the three categories. In other words, if something, if the problem is ill-defined, then it's likely that the solution and the process will also be ill-defined. I'd like to take a couple of moments to briefly address a category of ill-defined problems which would be called the analytic ill-defined problems. And those are problems where the goal is clear, the solution process is not, but what constitutes, constitutes a solution is also clear. Uh, Simon uh, addressed these, among uh, many other writers, and his particular examples were mathematical proofs of propositions which have yet to be proved, and uh, chess, which I'll talk about in a bit. Now, it, in a certain sense, it's a bit odd to think of why is chess an ill-defined problem? Well, it is in the sense that, I mean, we know the goal, that's quite clear, you want to win the game. We know the solution, we know what constitutes winning the game, but we don't have a process yet, a defined process that will lead to uh, that answer. And uh, I remember a lecture that I had uh, from a distinguished economist, which I, who I will not name, who said that uh, there must be a win for white in chess, so that it really is like a well-defined problem. We just don't know what that uh, strategy is as yet, but it must exist there. If it wasn't, if black had the winning uh, situation, then white could make an innocuous move, which would turn uh, uh, white, white back. There are two problems, I think, this argument. One is, it, is there such a thing as an innocuous move? And the other is that how do we know that the best play on both sides don't lead to a draw? Which I think is a more likely outcome given the wisdom of the game. But in any event, uh, the cognitive psychologists studied this and other problems, very mundane problems, some less mundane, the towers of Hanoi, is a problem that was very popular. The uh, nine dot problem was very popular. And uh, the, uh, the kinds of things that emerged were, uh, or the interest, let me put it that way, was how do people go about solving ill-defined problems? And in chess, which is the most, it's just a sort of like the fruit, fruit fly of geneticists. It seems to occur everywhere as a major area of study. And it seems as if the, the standard view was the ability to think many moves ahead. And I remember a case where uh, Roshevsky, who was then world champion, was touring uh, America playing all sorts of uh, blindfold tournaments and multiple tournaments and so on. But he was playing an uh, unknown player in the Midwest and he lost. And the press was very interested in this and came and visited. 
and they asked uh, Roshevsky, how many moves ahead do you think? He said, well, I think so many moves. And they asked the, the winner, how many moves do you think? And he said, one. <laughs> and said, well, how, how can you possibly win if you only think one move ahead? He said, I only think of the best move. <laughs> 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 I've thought about this for a long time, and it turns out that it's not as uh, bizarre as it sounds, because uh, Dutchman de Groot is really the main scholar studying this aspect of problem solving. And it turns out that chess ability doesn't really depend so much on thinking many moves ahead, but rather on a, a large stock of potential pattern recognition uh, uh, so that the chess, the, the, the more able player can draw on this stock and, and it's that that is his particular ability. There have been interesting tests like putting uh, chess patterns and asking laymen and or better players or worse players to recall what they've seen and the better chess players recall much better what the pattern was. But if the chess play pieces are put down in a way that is not reflective of the game, then the masters do no better than the lay people in uh, remembering what the pieces were. Which rather rather say that this business of the stock of pattern recognition is quite uh, important. So there's a limited amount to uh, learn from this particular case of the analytic ill-defined, and it mainly has to do with this pattern recognition issue, which will come up in my discussion as we move along. <clears throat> there is uh, one little, I'd like to put a little footnote in, forecasting, which is rather important in the issue of economics expertise, is has the same structure as the analytic ill-defined. That is, with forecasting, the goal is quite clear. I want to forecast the rate of inflation three years from now. Whether I've succeeded or not is quite clear, or more or less. However, the process of forecasting is <laughs> unclear, exactly like the analytic ill-defined problem. There's no set principle that you must follow to make forecasts and so on. I will talk a bit more about forecasting. Yes? Questions are, in mean, the examples of analytic ill-defined problems that you've given um, are all ones in which, um, uh, in a mathematical sense, there exists a solution, but that solution is not accessible to us due to computational complexity. Well, yes. It, That's the, so that seems to be a sort of... Well, it hasn't been, like, the mathematical proofs, uh, there are many that lurk around there. For example, on the simple problem, like the nine-dot problem, uh, four is the minimum number of straight lines that you can do to solve the problem. I don't know if there's a proof of that. But, but what I'm saying is that, let's say in a problem like, in a problem like chess, yeah. um, we know from theorems in game theory that, that, that there will exist a, a winning strategy, or at least a sort of strategy for a draw, that, that must just exist as a matter of logic, but yeah. it is due to computational complexity that we do not know what it is. Or, yeah. Or, or likewise, I mean, we, we know uh, for sure that something like, I don't know, Goldbach's conjecture is going to be either true or false, or, you know, perhaps yeah. there's a sort of remote possibility of an incompleteness case, but set, set that aside. But again, uh, the computational complexity at this point uh, does not make the, the answer accessible to us at, yeah. right, right now. But on the other hand, it's something like, let's say, forecasting of the weather or the economy, at, at least potentially, there is a stochastic element uh, as, as well, and so that seems to set those problems somewhat apart from, from That's the right. analytic. That's uh, right, and it's exactly to that area that I want to turn now. But one, yes. So, so um, would you say that uh, the ability to prove in mathematics involves pattern recognition? Uh, well. Uh, 
what's his name, Hadamard, has written quite a lot on the psychology of, of mathematical problem solving and how they work. Uh, and whether there's, he, he talks a lot about whether there's thinking without words. So that, which does in a way relate to the pattern solving problem, but uh, I, I don't want to go too far okay. with this. And I'd like to turn to ill-defined problems closer to the social sciences. And there's quite an interesting literature of whether there's expertise or not in these areas, and if there is, how does it come about? And I'll give you a little romp through the literature here. Huge variety of, of uh, real world, if you like, ill-defined problems. For example, sentencing by judges is an ill-defined problem. Another, uh, which I was not aware of at all, is uh, in medicine, uh, interpreting x-rays for certain problems is an ill-defined problem. There are no uh, set rules. There are a couple of studies in economics, and uh, one in international relations. And the thing about these studies is that they don't really, on the whole, answer the question, is there expertise in ill-defined problems? What they do do is look at how people who are classified as experts seem to go about solving problems, and whether they, uh, what, what are the characteristics that they use. Uh, there is an exception in medicine, which is kind of interesting, and it's a sort of illustrative of this literature, uh, where senior uh, doctors choose candidates for uh, internships and special positions within uh, medicine. And this is one of the rare cases where we can ask how well do the experts perform because there is data on the people that they've rejected and the people that they've accepted. And so we can ask, how well do the doctors do at selecting people? And it turns out that they don't do all that well. <laughs> uh, they do do a bit better than the lay people, but not uh, much better. Yes? Yeah, well. <laughs> I thought I had. <laughs> <laughs> so I was wondering to what extent is an ill-defined problem reflective of our ability to actually say understand in our own conceptual terms the solution process right. as opposed to being able to solve it because you gave the example of, of x-ray analysis yeah. and then if you think about the problem of Go, yeah. we've computers, so deep Google Deep Mind, basically solved Go. Yeah. And it plays vastly better than any human, vastly better than any computer. Yeah. And we can train computers to do x-ray analysis where they're basically more accurate than any humans as well. Yeah. We know that, but the problem is we can't understand why the computer is better, right? In, our, in, in terms that are comprehensible in our own conceptual scheme. Yeah. So does that make those problems ill-defined or not? Because we can solve them computationally in a reliable fashion that, that permits you know, accurate forecasting and prediction, but we don't necessarily understand the, the, the rules by which it's done. Uh, I'm not sure what, 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 what exactly, when you started out, I thought I knew the answer <coughs> to the question, but as you went on, I, 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 what is the question exactly? Is it the case that ill-posed problems are one, is, is it something that we, can't solve, or oh, is it that right. we can we, we just don't understand why right. a solution right. works? Or, or, right. Right. So okay. Now, one thing that Simon discusses mm -hmm. is that it could be a very subjective thing. That is, uh, a better talented person or a more able person or a better program might be able to solve this problem, 
for a less able person, it's, it remains a, a ill-defined problem. Now, th this issue is kind of important. However, when it comes to economic policy, which as you can see I'm gradually creeping up on in a roundabout way, uh, there is, this issue doesn't really arise because nobody's an expert in this area. Nobody can do better, so it, it doesn't really cause uh, a problem. Uh, now, uh, let me tell you about uh, these, well, I've told you about these doctors and how they perform. What worries me is that it's not really a test of medical expertise. It's more like a test of judging academic performance. And there's no reason, really, why senior doctors should be particularly good <coughs> at judging academic performance. One second. But uh, what they do have, I think, is the authority to make the decision whether or not they have any particular special ability. Yes, do you? Well, when you say much the doctors don't perform very well, is there anyone that performs better than the doctors? No. So, it, <coughs> is, can you say the doctors don't perform very well? It could be that they perform extremely well given the data, but it's intrinsically too random for them to do better than, than they can do. Yes, yes. Uh, well, they do do a bit better. That's, a, that, that's about it. But I, I don't regard it as a very successful uh, test of whether there's expertise or not. Let me give you an example from economics. Uh, this, this is a, a one paper. There are a couple of papers that roughly of this kind. You ask people to read a, about an economic problem. A, a classic one is about agricultural issues in the Soviet Union. And you have uh, lay people, and then you have economists, and then you quiz them afterwards on how much they remember about what they've read. And the economists do a lot better. Now, again, I'm not sure that this is a very clear uh, uh, test of uh, expertise. But uh, I'm going to come back to that issue in a, in a minute. I would like to make the case briefly that most or that many significant economic problems are ill-defined. And, and in order to do that, which may seem quite obvious to many people, but it, it does require a bit of investigation. One issue with well-defined problems is that there tends to be a lot of agreement among experts. But with ill-defined problems, even among the experts, there's less agreement. And I think economics makes a good case, as a good example, rather suggesting that uh, many economic problems are uh, ill-defined. Lipsy and others discuss the uh, importance of context, of how crucial it is for economic analysis, and that suggests, again, that economic problems tend to be ill-defined. But there are also issues, and this gets a little tricky, in terms of the goal. So let's take an example like, would Greece be better off in the euro or out? Now, that problem, you could say, well, better off for whom? I mean, the, the, the richer people in Greece, the poorer people, younger people, older people, people in the public sector, people in the tourist sector, others, and are we talking five years ahead or ten years ahead and so on and so on. I mean, it just gets absolutely overwhelming. Now, one could trivialize, in my view, the problem by saying, when we ask whether Greece would be better off in or out of the earth, Let's think about the effect on gross domestic product four years from now. And if we define it in that way, it becomes a kind of imposed uh, well-defined problem by trivializing it. And I think that is very dangerous. It could actually give the right answer <coughs> if one was lucky. 
but it very well could ignore important considerations and very likely to be very dangerous. So translating a, uh, a uh, ill-defined problem into a well-defined problem, I think it's, uh, is a bad, uh, bad mistake. So uh, let me think a little bit more about expertise in addressing, well, I, I, hope, I hope we can agree that there are a lot of ill-defined and important problems in economics, but I would like to now turn to the question of, is anybody better at these problems than other people? Well, there are about a, a dozen studies that have been done, maybe more of this question, and I'll report on a few of them just to give you a sort of idea of where the, <clears throat> where the debate seems to stand. An interesting recent one that's due to be published in the Journal of Political Economy and also the Journal of Economic Perspectives draws on the <coughs> Amazon <coughs> excuse me, uh, uh, a Mechanical Turk program. I suppose most many of you are familiar with this program that uh, enables researchers to put questions on uh, the, the program and a small reward is offered and people can self-select to take part in this program. And one of them that's been done recently by two researchers whose names elude me at the moment managed to get 20,000 people to sign up for this program. Of course, they're self-selected. They're given, they're rewarded one dollar. Twenty thousand people came forward to get a dollar for ten minutes of work. And what they were asked to do was a very simple task for ten minutes: to hit the A key and the B key in sequence. And the more that they did this, the higher their score. And the 20,000 were broken down into 18 groups of about 1,000 each. Yes, that's right. And were given different incentives. So one group was said, if you score over 100, you will get, for every score of 100, you get an extra penny. <coughs> the others, if you score over so much, an extra penny will be given to the Red Cross. In some it was 10 cents will be given to the Red Cross. In still others, there was a, what you will get is a chance, you'll be put into a lottery if you score so much, you'll get a chance of a thousand dollars, and so on. And then uh, we have the results of these various incentive schemes. And then we put the question to three groups. Behavioral economists, I'll say something about behavioral economics later on. Uh, psychologists, and the celebrated man in the street. And it turns out that uh, the economists and the psychologists do about the same, significantly better, than the uh, lay people. One interesting thing to me is that the uh, ordering of incentives is the same among the lay people and among the uh, experts. However, the actual magnitudes are much better understood by the experts than the, uh, than the lay people. There are other studies uh, there's this issue of bias in economics. It's maintained that some uh, well-known departments like Chicago and Stanford are very conservative in their nature. Uh, they feel that uh, it's, it's alleged anyhow that uh, interventions in the economy are likely to be costly and ineffective whereas other departments like Harvard and MIT are reputed to hold that uh, market failure is quite common and uh, success successful improvements are 
are quite likely. So uh, this particular study gathered together a larger selection of economists from all these different schools, carefully stratified and so on, and put questions to them. And a number of interesting things uh, emerged. That first of all, there was far more agreement among the economists than was anticipated by the researchers. And also, this agreement, for lack of it, correlated very much with the extent to which the problem had been studied. So if there was a large literature on this topic, then the economists had a high degree of agreement, but if not, a much uh, less degree of agreement. And uh, so that was encouraging from that point of view. A very similar study posed a, re uh, a question between, uh, again, the celebrated man on the street and economists asked a whole series of questions of this kind. <coughs> uh, is uh, supporting the motor industry uh, uh, on the balance uh, 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 beneficial or not beneficial? Are CEOs overpaid or not? And so on. A whole series of questions like this. And the uh, authors compare the answers from economists to the celebrated man in the street. And it turns out that they clearly are different. A, a, there's a very significant difference in response from the economist to the public. Uh, there's a high degree, again, of agreement among the economists, particularly when the literature is large. And uh, the economists, uh, everybody was asked to report how confident they were in their results. And the economists, there were an interest, a few interesting things. Uh, on the whole, men were more confident than women. And also people who had worked in Washington were more <laughs> confident than, uh, than others. However, uh, the authors of this study say that the economists answered these questions as if they were the authors don't use this term, but they do say they answered it as if they were well-defined problems, and as if the standard some assumptions of economics obtained, whereas the uh, non-economists did not answer them in that way. And the author uh, does, the authors do say that they hope that if these same economists were to be involved in policy, they would not treat these problems as if they were well defined and would very possibly come up with very different answers. The thing that crossed my mind is would that move them closer to what the non-economists felt about these issues? How would that, uh, that pan out? Uh, well, so where I stand at the moment is that of course it's a very difficult thing to determine expertise of whether it exists in economics. I do think economists do a bit better than others. However, there's been this issue of forecasting. There's a very large literature, ancient and modern, replete with failures of economists to make uh, accurate forecasts. Some of this, I think, can be dismissed out of Hand because there are certain things uh, that uh, there's no reason to uh, expect an economist to be able to forecast them well. For, uh, for example, uh, even the best uh, statisticians do no better at roulette than uh, the lay person, and a lot of economic problems are designed in such a way that there is no particular advantage. The forecasts that are made uh, usually, say, inflation two years ahead or unemployment and so on, are on a business-as-usual assumption. 
So we assume that things that we borrow is the same. We tweak a bit with special considerations, and the economists do fairly well. And then something big happens, and the forecast is wildly wrong. A war, a national disaster, or something of that kind. I don't think this shows us much of anything. However, there are also cases where the uh, disaster is internal to the economy. For example, the 2007 problems which exist with us today. Now, in my view, this is not, uh, in that sense, a forecasting problem, uh, because the problems of the economy could be observed <coughs> simply by looking out the window. That is, it was not a matter of predicting, looking into the future, the structure of the mortgage market and so on, and the fact that that was missed is indeed, I think, a failure or a problem of economics. But it's not, in my view, a forecasting problem. I believe it comes about because of excessive specialization. The finance people were unconcerned with issues of macro stability, and on the cold, the macroeconomists were ignoring finance as a potential problem. I think it has more to do with that. Now, uh, I would like to come to the core of my discussion. In the light of these considerations, it seems to me to be quite clear that uh, ability in well-defined economic problems, as is taught in the classroom, is a very important contributor to ability with ill-defined problems in three ways. First of all, I think training in well-defined problems teaches people how to think and how to solve problems. Now, you may say that that's a rather trivial contribution, but I don't think it is. It is by no means obvious. And there's an excellent quote I found from uh, an employer of economists who thinks that uh, economics really doesn't have much to say. I think he's wrong about that. But he employs them because he thinks they know how to address problems. And I do think that's the case. And I think it's an important skill. Secondly, economics of uh, well-defined problems does teach people about uh, a certain structure of thought, which you could call the economy economic way of looking at things, which has to do with issues like who are the main players, what are the interactions, what are the choices that people have, in the, and what are the options open to them, and so on. Considerations of that kind, <coughs> what are the likely consequences of aggregation, and so on. These are very important uh, skills to have. And finally, there's a very, very large stock of specific theory, specific theory. Now, I would like to say something about the work of uh, Danny Roddick, who um, does feel that economics deals with well-defined problems. And he's revived what used to be called the toolkit approach to economics, uh, the idea being that there's a whole range of economic theory out there, and the skill of the economist is to select the particular theory that has to be, uh, the particular tool, the particular theory that has to be applied in every case. What's different about Rada is he thinks that context is very important. However, he does feel that that just means that we have more theories. So instead of there's a single theory, there's a theory for each context. I think that's fancy. Yes. So I didn't want to interrupt you. Yes. <laughs> what? I didn't want to interrupt you, either, but, oh. uh, but I, now I ask my question. Yeah, anyway. yeah. <laughs> this time it's a pop now. Um, I, I was interested in how to think about it if we go back to the chess analogy. Yes. So if if you can learn something from well-defined problems, yeah. 
that should mean that uh, you can, if it works for the chess analogy as well, yeah. that should mean that we can also learn something from, say, smaller settings of chess figures. Yeah. Um, and the interesting, interestingly, I think that's true in end games. Yeah. Um, where you could even you don't even have to show the whole um, chessboard. I think yeah. I mean, that, that's enough to just show the one constellation. But it's not true, kind of. I don't know the English terms. The opening, I suppose, and when you're sort of in the middle of the game. Yeah. So because then much more <coughs> holistic properties yeah. become important. I mean, does this travel from the chess analogy to economics? Are there kind of economic problems where it's really useful to, you know, just you know, look at small problems and then you learn something about um, yeah. the ill-defined problems from the well-defined yeah. and ill-defined uh, problems, uh, or yeah. most problems you, more like, you right. know, maybe the you opening, but that's not the case. Let me just, uh, you've anticipated something that I wanted to come to. Good, then I shut up. No, that's okay. I'm not maintaining that all real-world problems in economics are ill-defined. I'm saying that major policy ones are, and that many, many problems are, but not all problems. And, the, and your, your analogy of the small case, there are well-defined real-world problems that economics can address. But what I'm saying is, and this is the important message, I hope, that there are ill-defined problems, that they're uh, quite common, and that they call for skills in addition to the ones that are important from well-defined problems. So I've mentioned three things which I think the ability in well-defined problems contribute. The ability to the, the skills and basic skills in problem solving, the mode of thought of economics, and then this vast range of theory, which is a bit like the chess player's stock of patterns for recognition. But what the economists need in addition, and I think which is crucial to address ill-defined problems, is first of all to recognize that it is an ill-defined problem. Now one of the things that bothers me a bit about what I read mainly in the philosophy of economics literature is that you, you could ask, well, what is economics? And in this literature, it seems to me that economics is what is in the advanced textbooks. But what's in the advanced textbooks is all well-defined problems. And economics is actually an applied activity among all the other concerns. And there, I believe that there are special skills which are required to address ill-defined problems in addition to the gains that come from ability with well-defined problems. And what these special skills are, are the following. First of all, I think it's important to recognize that it isn't a uh, well ill-defined problem. And I can, there are many tragic examples in economics where this was not the case. For example, Margaret Thatcher's advisors, interestingly enough, all four thought that economics dealt with well-defined problems. And I'm going to come on to some of the work of Easterly and others, uh, which shows tragic cases where economists have treated ill-defined problems as if they were well-defined with disastrous consequences, particularly in less developed countries, but in another. So the most important central skill is to recognize that it is an ill-defined problem. Beyond that, there has to be a kind of uh, <coughs> a cautious curiosity. That is, the set of mind of a person dealing with well-defined problems is the desire to crack that problem. And once that problem, and the hope that it can be cracked, and once that problem is cracked, that's a great thing. In addressing ill-defined problems, one doesn't aim in that direction. One maintains a kind of curiosity that is there throughout. Another aspect, and all of these aspects are related, has to do with immersion. Sorry, just, just on that previous point. Yes. Um, is, is, is there not also an, an intermediate skill uh, that, that pe that's relevant in some situations, whereby you have what you think is an ill-defined problem, and actually part of the trick is to somehow convert it 
into a well-defined problem or, some, or, or something, a well-defined problem that's, that, that, that's something that's close to something you can solve? Yes, I think that's an aspect, but uh, it's, not, it's not the whole story. Let me talk about immersion. Years ago, Dick Cates from Harvard visited uh, LSE, the wonderful economist, and I argued with him a lot. And he used to uh, say that well, the way to address issues is to read as much as you possibly can around the problem, to know as much as you can about what, and just immerse yourself in more and more of this material. And that is a very important aspect. I thought he was completely wrong because I thought that economic problems were well-defined problems and immersion has nothing to do with it. Now, along with immersion goes this business of, I mean, a Popperian view, a strict view would say, well, that's impossible, there's an infinite number of facts out there. What, what, what do you want to immerse yourself in? But there is a kind of intuition and a selection process, which is, I think, important, which you could call uh, shift, uh, uh, sifting and so on. And then there's a the question of imagination and a question of judgment. And uh, I'm rather rushing through these because I'd like to kind of leave a bit of room for the following considerations. Part of the folklore of uh, economics that Bertrand Russell uh, thought uh, he would do economics, and uh, he abandoned it because he felt that economics was too easy. <laughs> and uh, Max Planck also started out in economics, and he abandoned it because he said he thought it was too difficult. <laughs> now, the, uh, what I'm discussing with you today this distinction between ill-defined and well-defined, I think, exactly explains what is going on here. That is, Russell was thinking of economics as a well-defined problem, and it was too easy for some. There are difficulties for others. But Planck was thinking of it as an ill-defined problem. And I think that that uh, accounts. Keynes himself, uh, the, the wonderful theorist, but also a master of applied economics. And he has a, a great passage where he writes about <coughs> the uh, skills, he, he writes about the paradox of economics, which he sees as the following. It's a fairly easy subject compared to physics or the higher reaches of philosophy. He does not uh, give great praise to applied philosophy, I'm sorry to say. But uh, he, he thinks that there's a paradox here because it's an easy subject, but nobody does it very well. Now, how is that the case? And his answer is partly what I've said, that there is a variety of, of skills needed a great combination of skills to move into actual solving of real economic problems. And he has a wonderful sentence where he says, the, the, the economist has to address the general in terms of the particular and the uh, concrete in terms of the abstract in the same flight of thought. Now, my view is that's a perfect picture of the skills needed to address ill-defined problems. Now, another aspect of ill-defined problems, which I mentioned earlier in the case of the gymnastics, is the fact that the practitioner in ill-defined problems takes part, in some cases, in the solution, in aesthetic matters. For example, many people in this area have discovered, uh, have explored what is it that uh, uh, people in architecture or design, what is expertise in this area? And part of it, if you think in terms of the breakdown of the problem, 
the goal, the activity, and the solution is that within these areas, the practitioner takes part in the solution. Whereas in the well-defined problem, in the running race, the runners don't decide who's won or what constitutes winning. But in an ill-defined problem, the practitioner can make a, a part. Now, in my view, <coughs> the standard view of economics is that the function of economics is to explain what's going on. And the rest of the world can make of it what they like. They can use this information or not. However, I think that's a little simplistic. Because if you take, say, for example, the goal of the, uh, which many people would have subscribed to, that there should be a fairer society or a fairer economy. Now, it seems to me that economists can well have an input into that goal because of the fact of it's being an ill-defined problem. However, they have not, their, their, their reason for the input is nothing to do with uh, being an economist as such. That is, what economics provides, if you take my picture of it, is the ability to address a question, not pulling theories off the wall that give you the, the answer. It worries me a bit in the current debates about, uh, for example, Brexit. Economists have views which they're entitled to have as concerned citizens. But it's interesting, when, we, when the UK was thinking of joining, Marcus Miller, who was here at LSE, he's now at Warwick, did a very careful study of the economic consequences, brilliant study, of the economic <coughs> consequences for the UK of joining. And he came to the conclusion that there would be a fairly substantial cost economically in joining the EU. Uh, some politicians chose to say that uh, that was wrong, it must be uh, economically beneficial. Others, which I think with a more balanced view, took the view that, uh, well, there may be economic costs, but there are other factors to consider which are of more important, so we should wear. A few years went by, Marcus Miller turned out to be right. There was a cost to the UK of joining the EU. I guess you mean joining the EC as it was. What? Joining the EC. Yes, that's right. Yes, that's right. Sorry. And uh, then the terms were renegotiated to try to make it a bit better. It's interesting now that I don't know of any serious studies. There may be some. But if it was costly to go in, why is it now going to be costly to go out? But of course it could be that having been in for a long period of time results in a sort of uh, 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 economic synergy that somehow changes the nature of the economy that we're going out. But anyhow, I'd like to draw the threads together and ask what are the implications of what I'm saying for uh, economics, uh, the debates within economics, <coughs> economic teaching, and economic policy. In economics, there's been a huge consensus, which didn't exist before, but does, has existed for the past 80 years or so, of how to proceed with uh, economic understanding, along with an active and dissenting group, which is saying, well, uh, the mainstream is uh, too mathematical, doesn't, it isn't historical enough, it doesn't consider institutions enough, and so on. And that debate has been going on for some time. My feeling is that thinking in terms of ill-defined and well-defined issues gives the role of the different activities and should go some way to raising the level of that debate. When it comes to teaching, I think it's fair to say that the teaching of economics is almost entirely in terms of well-defined problems. And there are people who argue that uh, the place to do ill-defined stuff is learning on the job. And that it's the function of the uh, academic teaching 
to stick to the well-defined problems. Other people say, well, if you did a little less mass, there'd be more room for these other things, which is undoubtedly correct. On the other hand, there are still other people who say, for some good reason, that what we need is more mass, that, uh, that the mass is, is not sufficiently developed and so on. I don't know what the answer is. The only thing which I feel fairly strongly about is that it would be a very good thing if all students of economics were encouraged to read my paper. <laughs> uh, and then, when we come to economic policy, there I think this distinction between the well and ill defined is extremely important. Easterly is, as I think I mentioned, produced very convincing examples of disastrous things done, particularly in poor countries, by imposing, as if they were uh, well defined problems, policy moves. So the main question I would like to suggest is if you're choosing an economic advisor, which is the, in a sense that is the ill-defined problem in and of itself, but I have some advice in that area, and that is try to find an economist who is good at ill-defined problems. Thank you.